Welcome to the Malibu studio. If you like to eat, this segment is for you. I would say it's a little bit of a cooking segment, but you'll want to recognize what's on your plate and how that food is made after this segment. We're going to talk three important parts. One is about the oils that we choose. One is about the seafood that we're choosing and also how to get your grill on in a healthful way. All right, stay tuned. Andrew Gruel is up. I have Andrew Gruel in the kitchen. He is a chef and a restaurant owner. You've got a new place. He was uh, the owner of Slap Fish. If any of you guys have ever been to that, it was kind of a fast casual. Now it's Calico... Calico Fish House. Calico Fish House. So fun. All right, and this one's more fancy. So if you like Slap Fish, but you like the fish idea, right? Yeah. It's still a fish idea. Yeah. Okay, so that's why Andrew's here, because I've been talking to Andrew for... How many years? Millions? Got from the uh, aquarium. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. He was teaching me about how we're overfishing. In those days, we had country of origin labeling. I don't mm -hmm. think we do that anymore, no, no. which is tragic. Labels have changed. I'm sad about that. But anyway, that's how I met Andrew, and he was a chef before that, and then he opened these great restaurants, and that's what we're going to talk about today. One of the things is called choose the dish, not the fish, which is my favorite, because we buy too much of this. Is that not accurate? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's true. Tuna, yeah, we're a tuna I like tuna, you know, I have, well, obviously I have both of these things. But the idea is to not eat the ones that we always eat, and we kind of always do. Yeah, we want to diversify our palates. We don't want to eat down through a species, right, until it's extinct. Because yeah. if we can diversify the menu, then we're obviously relieving the pressure off of a lot of these different stocks that are just getting hammered. Yeah, and and you guys probably could guess, it's shrimp, it's salmon, it's, shri it's shrimp, it's salmon, it's tuna, it's tilapia, and then, you know, down the line, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, so um, and part of the fishing thing is not our problem. It's sad, and we don't want to really go there about the trawlers and all that, but, but by and large, if you can choose something that's similar, and Andrew's going to make a dish today just to kind of prove the point, and it, so in other words, if it's fatty, right, mm -hmm. yeah. then you pick another fatty one. Exactly. Yeah. Fatty, if it's firm, if it's steaky. I mean, I kind of break fish up into like really, really mild and flaky, medium, and then your firm, steaky fish, right? So your swordfish, your tuna, yeah. and then the opa, which we'll talk about today. Okay. And um, what is, what would be uh, a tilapia alternative? Oh, I mean, any rockfish here in California, which is great because there's so many varieties of rockfish, red vermilion snapper, or the, you know, kind of the golden sand bass that most people don't know about that eat just like a mild flaky white fish like tilapia, but you can get it locally and you can kind of relieve some of the pressure off of all the other species. Halibut's kind of tough. I don't think people eat that anymore because it kind of was overfished, right? Yeah, well, halibut is pretty well managed because most of it stays local between Canada and the United States. Now, what's interesting is, is that there's California halibut, which is more of kind of a flounder, right, or a ground fish that is really well managed as well and high in abundancy in terms of the biomass of the stock. So you can look for a California halibut or the more well-known Alaskan halibut. Right. And then salmon, no choice there, or what would you all I mean, I mean, look, salmon is great. It's incredibly healthy for you. Um, so I never want to kind of, you know, put salmon down. I just think in general, diversifying your palate and seafood is a good thing but always having salmon even if you have it one time a week you get those DHAs omega-3s yeah. it's all very very healthy right and you know my girlfriend has uh, there's these uh, National Geographic cams where you can watch bears stand by the creek and you know watch the salmon and you know they try to get a few well anyway point was apparently this year not so many salmon running which broke my little heart you know? yeah it does and salmon. the California salmon fishery was actually shut down because their spawning grounds have been developed so they're losing a lot of people think it's the ocean but it's actually not it's the spawning ground so when we develop along the coastline or we don't have all that fresh water because we might subvert it into other reservoirs or we're running into water issues well then you don't have those grounds through which the salmon can spawn and then live out in the ocean you sent me a link um, and I just always love to share with you guys anything if you're kind of interested in what we're overfishing or what we're eating too much of which are two separate things but what was the, what was the uh, website you would say uh, people should go to to look for these kinds of things well you can go to uh, the National Fisheries uh, Institute NFI, which is obviously kind of the American trade organization for everything seafood related and international, or Intrafish is a great publication as well that gives you a lot of those stats and specifics. So I-N-T-R-A? Intra. Intrafish. Yes. Intra okay. Intrafish. Okay. okay, but we're going to start off, even though I just digressed about fish, um, I want to start out with oil, okay? When Andrew and I got together, we said, hey, what should we talk about? There's so many things we could talk about with food, but this is kind of a thing, you know? Obviously, to cook... Uh, or to eat, you generally have a fat going on your plate. And mm -hmm. so we kind of wanted to talk about separating, uh, not good and bad, but you know, things that we would maybe want to consume more of and things maybe we should just stop maybe cooking with, right? And seed oils were kind of what we were coming up with. So if you were going to say, 
They're not bad boys. But if you said, hey, we're getting a little too much, these are called omega-6 oils, by the way, guys, not to make you go scientific, but by and large, all the fats have a little bit of mono, poly, and saturated, but some have way more poly and saturated, and that could be good, but now we have too many in our diet, right? So if you said, hey, I would like you to eat less of these, which ones would you choose? Well, I would say eat less of your canola oils, your grapeseed oils. Canola is the killer, right? Any vegetable oil. I like to use um, fats that, number one, are healthier in general, right? So it actually does go back to seafood because here's why. <laughs> yeah. The reason we want to eat more seafood is because we don't want to have that imbalance of your omega-6s and your omega-3s. You kind of want to have a good balance of omega-3s to omega-6s. The majority of your omega-3s can come from seafood, your DHAs as well. But when you're consuming way too much omega-6s, well then you have that imbalance. And it's that imbalance that leads to things like hypertension, a lot of kind of inner um, you know, inflammation, that's what we hear a lot about nowadays, and you know, many of the other kind of elements of what we consider the Western diet. Right. Um, and it, even in certain meats, right? Because they feed meat grain at the end and that's high on omega-6s. So even in your chickens and your beef, you're sometimes getting, especially in those commercial products, that omega-6 element. So if we're getting it in all of our processed foods because everything is cooked in canola oil or a seed oil, right. and then we're cooking with those canola seed oils, and then we're also buying it, you know, getting it in our meats, and we're not eating that much seafood, well then that's where you end up with that massive imbalance, which then just kind of in summary can lead to the inflation. Inflation. <laughs> See what I'm thinking <laughs> yeah, about? Right. The, 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 and that leads to health problems, yeah. which leads to inflation. Yeah. Correct, correct. <laughs> Inflammation. <laughs> Yes. So in the old days, guys, it was like three to one omega threes to uh, omega sixes, or or I could reverse that. But now it's about twenty six uh, polyunsaturates or seed oils to one omega three. We're not getting enough of those omega threes. And omega threes in the in the ones that absorb really well are the fish fishy types. The the fish are eating uh, nice algae, and and we're getting that nice fish. The DHA and EPA, which Hopefully that doesn't alphabet soup swim you yeah. in your head. Um, but there are others like walnuts and flax seeds and things like that. However, we don't convert that very well. So we're really looking for the fish types or the algae types, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is why that's so important to your health. And yes, you could always supplement, but man, food's first in my opinion, not you. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, because you don't always get the full um, you know effect. It doesn't synthesize in the same way as when you take it in a pill or an oil or a capsule. In addition to the fact that environmentally, a lot of times when they create these vitamins or these supplements, they're not necessarily using sustainable seafood, mm -hmm. so we also have to think about that piece of it. The other thing too, and this is just kind of a gross sidebar, but I interviewed a guy once that was really wanting to know how they, and let's be clear, a fish oil would be a byproduct, okay? So somebody's going to be a salmon uh, producer, they're going to they're going to be manufacturing in a way a, a box of seafood, whatever sent somewhere. So that fish that you know, if they cut them up and put them in fillets, the oil is what is to the side. And so this guy goes over to let's say Costa Rica or wherever it was, and he said the the, the oil drum sitting on the dock. That's where your oil was, and it wasn't pretty. It's not, and then you know you do have to clean that up. So mm -hmm. how was it cleaned up? which is the exact reason why we're talking about these oils. Because when we talk about a canola, have you guys ever seen a canola? Have you seen a canola? I mean, <laughs> what is a canola? I mean, you know, we might know what a grapeseed is or, you know, or some of these other oils, but canola, I think, has over 50 processes in its, you know, from a chemical to a strain to a uh, oxidized. There's so many different uh, processes. So you're not getting something deliciously yummy like you would, let's say, an avocado oil or a or let's say an olive oil. So um, I laugh at these. These are not. These are still in my pantry, and I don't even think this is Wes. And I'm not making fun of Wes. And I'm saying I don't think Wesson's in business anymore. I don't know how. But this I do for furniture. Well, I just I use use it on furniture. Not that you cannot ever have all uh, a vegetable oil, but you would say if we're going to use maybe some of the others to cook with. I kind of thought these were kind of fun. Um, and I wanted to bring up another important point about monounsaturated oil. So olive oil is great. If you're buying uh, extra virgin, mm -hmm. cold pressed olive oil. That's really important, guys. So, and I'm not making fun of this company. This is all in marketing, extra light tasting. So is it extra light in calories? Is it light in color? Is it light in taste? Now this wouldn't then be an extra virgin cold pressed olive oil. If you guys have ever tasted one or looked at the bottle, you would see that generally, like this one will tell me 
uh, where it was, almost like a bottle of wine, what valley, what percent acid, and generally in the back, it should have a sell by date. You want one recent. You don't want to have an old white wine. Right? Correct. Yeah, you yeah. don't want it to oxidize. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I think California has some pretty strict laws on olive oil. Oh, it definitely does, especially because we produce so much olive oil mm -hmm. in the state, so it would be a natural you know, kind of connection right there. Yeah. Anyway, so um, that's kind of fun. Now, Andrew's got some other things here, though, that I think are fun to pay attention to. So maybe talk about some of these these boys that most like nobody in, in my family would pick up the beef tallow, right? But now beef tallow's back, guys. So yeah, you have uh, beef tallow, right? Yeah, yeah, beef tallow. I mean, so you're getting a lot more vitamins and you're getting a lot more minerals from a lot of these animal fats, which once were considered to be bad for your cholesterol. But now we've obviously learned that, especially when it comes to cholesterol, we talk about these healthy oils, the HDLs, right? That yeah. balance that HDL LDL ratio is sometimes is a lot more important than total cholesterol. In this case, you're getting not just the health element, but you're also getting a ton of flavor. Yeah. When you cook with things like beef tallow, which is just refined beef fat, when you cook with ghee, which is actually really just a clarified butter. So ghee is butter that's been right. had the moisture slowly cooked out of it, but not at a high temperature so that you still maintain a lot of the nutritional value. Mm -hmm. And when you go back to your light olive oil, or your pure olive oil, I would still use those, but I would use those for cooking. Mm -hmm. Because once you bring your extra virgin olive oil up above around 300 degrees, right. it oxidizes. So you lose all the properties that you paid that good money for. Right. And it's not even necessarily that at that stage it's bad for you. You're kind of just burning dollars. Yeah, that's big. So, so good point. And that's, um, so yeah, olive oil does, they, does not have a high smoke point, right? So we would use uh, avocado, right? Yeah, avocado oil is yeah. where you're going to get into that 400 degree smoke point and your avocado oil, avocado oil is very rich. And once again, it's not a seed oil, so it, it avocado is really a fruit. Um, and you have the ability to cook at a much higher heat and the ghee is the same. So after you've clarified those milk solids and the moisture out of there, you can use ghee to cook at probably 400, 450 degrees. Would a um, vegan use ghee or because now the dairy is out or is that like no? I mean, that's kind of, you know, different levels of veganism, but oh. I have seen many vegans yeah. that do cook with, with ghee for that very purpose. And ghee traditionally is actually Indian and they're known for right. being vegans or vegetarians. So um, right. there's kind of a purification process that they stand by. Okay. And duck fat. Yeah. Duck mm -hmm. fat. Who knew, right? I, I didn't. No. Duck, you know, ducks as a poultry item, they have so much exterior fat on them, which isn't just, you know, it, which, which isn't... Uh, um, a large surplus, but it's also delicious. Okay. And uh, so duck fat is great to cook with, especially when you're talking about potatoes, duck fat, fried potatoes, fries. Same with the beef towel. We actually are 100% seed oil free at our restaurants. Wow. So we cook with beef tallow okay. in the deep fryer. Oh, wow. Um, so, and, and I'll tell you what, the flavor is unbelievable. Okay. People who don't even care about seed oils come back just because they don't understand that flavor. <laughs> That's what McDonald's used to cook with back in the uh, 80s, yeah. 70s, and 80s. And so when you would yeah. drive by McDonald's and you were, you know, you so, start salivating, it was that beef tallow. Oh my gosh. And then I didn't cook the bacon, but Andrew said, of course, you know, my mom, which I thought was so funny, she would cook bacon and then she'd pour the grease in a Crisco can, <laughs> empty Crisco, remember Crisco? I think it's still around. But anyway, obviously yep. be bacon fat, you know, and you guys, we've talked, if you're watching the show, you know, Johnny Bowden was on, we were talking about cholesterol and how saturated fat is no longer considered this big issue. It, if you're paying attention to some other things in your diet. So I won't go boring you with that, but don't be afraid to eat some of these saturated fats that are done really well. As a matter of fact, Epic, I know is a really great uh, company, not that we're promoting anybody's, nobody's getting promoted for anything here, but I know that's a really good mm -hmm. oil. So you just, you do want to pick an oil that is, uh, is good for you. And you did say something to me about how animals, uh, this was also something we talked about before, um, the new sneaky labeling law on, on grass-fed animals is that cows or any livestock can be fed grass the first six months of their life. So now, now these, these uh, producers are saying, yeah, we can say it's grass fed, but if you're finishing them off by grain, mm -hmm. uh, especially grain that where they didn't have good grain, wasn't great grain, yeah. then you're not getting a great product any longer. Yeah, of course. Right? And, and you know, and yeah. you can even take that a step further, not to introduce a boogeyman, but even antibiotics, right? Like you can use antibiotics on livestock as long as the last four, last level of their life life um, cycle doesn't have the antibiotics, you can market it as antibiotic free. So you always want to ask more questions. When you go and dig into your protein products, you can go to company websites, you can call and ask. And a lot of times they'll just tell you honestly, yeah, we use antibiotics at this stage or not in this stage. And as a general rule of thumb, 
happy animals don't need antibiotics. Right, right. Yeah, they're doing well. Um, what I had done, and not that we can all afford to do this all the time, but um, as we had Johnny Bottom on, as you guys have watched, and the whole deal is buy the best, but eat less of it. Just mm -hmm. make sure you have the proper portion. So then, you know, then you use it sparingly and you really, really enjoy it. But a lot of these companies like Butcher Box and Crowd Cow, um, if you go online, they will show you videos of their farmer. And the farmer will be in Wisconsin or Northern California or whatever. And you can see video of the chickens and how they live. And it makes you kind of feel a little bit better about, all right, I'm going to eat this and I'm helping this farmer. And these animals are living well. They died well because dying well is important too. Very, no, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. So. Huh. And, and one, one thing too, that actually applies to most farms and ranches is that people would be surprised. You can call them directly and say, hey, I want to take a piece of X, Y, and Z. And they'll set it aside for you. They'll process it for you. They'll ship it to you. They like doing that. Oh. But, but it's not a huge market because they're farmers by trade and ranchers. So they're not, uh, they don't understand the marketing element of getting their products from point A to point B. When you call and kind of do the work for them, yes. they're more than willing to do so. That is cool. All right, so hopefully you guys have a clear, more clear understanding about the seed oils. And you know, don't feel guilty. I was saying to Andrew, you know, if I go to, let's say I go to Costco and I buy all sorts of really great products that are already marinated, they're frozen. Um, there's some really good ones and they make some really fun things that I'm probably not gonna come home and bake from scratch. I'll look and they'll use canola oil. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of go, ooh, but that just means I get a little canola in my life. It doesn't mean that I've got the big jug on my counter. It means I'm gonna get some. Um, if you're buying a lot of processed foods though, if you're buying a lot of ultra processed, meaning you're driving through constantly, chances are you are getting more than you should. So for sure at home, Try to go with these guys and you might see some health changes. It's definitely less inflammatory for your body if you're going to pick some of these other uh, fats. So on that note, uh, we will kind of roll into um, our fish stuff. Our fish so we're going to sear the fish here. And one of the things about using oils and fats is, is that sometimes we use way too much. We actually pour it into the pan and then we don't need that. The only real purpose of the fat is just to make it so that the product doesn't stick to the pan. You get a little bit of favor, flavor from that fat, but once it starts pooling in the pan, that's all excess. And when we consume that, that's how we end up with all of this fat in our diet that traditionally when we do use seed oils, that's that omega-6 imbalance. So I've got some fresh ghee here. And what I like to do when I'm cooking with fat is, is that I get a silicone brush and I paint the pan, right? Because all you need is that thin layer in there. And this is going to prevent you from using way too much fat, which frankly, you know, there's a cliche in the culinary world that fat is flavor, and that is true. A, the right amount of fat is flavor. Excess fat is not flavor. It actually will mute, mute your palate so that there's almost a film on your palate that prevents you from tasting all the unique characteristics of either the protein or the vegetable that you're sauteing in general. So if you notice, I'm kind of just painting this pan here, and even what, I, what looked like it was a small amount of fat is even starting to kind of pool in here because we don't realize, especially when fat's in a cold state, how little we need to use. So I'm bringing this pan up right here. I'm cooking with the ghee, which does have a higher smoke point because we've clarified both the water and the milk solids out of the butter. And then I'm gonna wait for this to come up just before it smokes. You'll almost see little wisps of smoke on the actual pan itself. Now, the fish that I'm cooking today is called opa. Now, opa, most people haven't heard of this before. It is a Pacific fish and it's bycatch. Right, so this is not a targeted species. This is bycatch as part of the longline swordfish and the tuna fish. Um, and opa are these huge sunfish. They're known as sunfish, moonfish, roundfish. People don't, as I mentioned, people don't target them, but it's an incredibly delicious fish. I say that this eats just like a mix of swordfish and tuna, which is ironic that it's part the bycatch from those specific industries. We sell this at the restaurant. Um, it is absolutely delicious. People love it. This is a steakier fish. It's not that high in mercury, um, you know, like maybe sometimes a swordfish might be. And it's really, really easy to cook because it's so rich, right? Like you can see, this doesn't flake off. It doesn't fall apart. Um, and, it, and it is a beautiful fish. So I've got, uh, you know, a little seasoning on here. I'm just going to hit it with a little salt and drop it into the pan and start to just give it that sear. Now, when I cook fish, I don't go too hard and hot in the beginning. I like to let it cook in the pan and I'll get a nice sear on there on this one side so that it doesn't stick. And I'll leave it on that side for probably two to three minutes. I flip it over. At that point, I'll cook it on the other side and then I might deglaze the pan or just hit it with some sort of a liquid. That could be wine, citrus juice. Um, it could be you know fresh citrus, orange juice, tomato juice. 
or even a fish fume or a fish stock, and then I finish it with whole butter at the end. That is the key, that is the formula to perfectly cooking fish, okay. in this case, in underutilized species. Okay, so kind of like if you did the juice or the wine or whatever you're putting in it, it would always be just cold and then... Yeah, so yeah, just, yeah, just add it cold, add your butter in there, and then that also creates the pan sauce. So one pan cooking, you don't need a ton of pans, you know, kind of blowing the kitchen out, and uh, just kind of let the fish do the work. And this is a pretty thick piece of fish. This is a thick piece of fish. Now you can eat this fish medium, so we don't need to necessarily cook it all the way through, but in this case, I'll turn the heat down after it gets a nice sear on there so that it does a nice lower and slower cook. Okay. If you wanted to, you could actually just put the pan after you flip it over directly in the oven and then finish it after you pull it from the oven. Anything works. Got it, okay. And, and so this is called opa, and can I get this at the regular grocery store? In many cases, yeah, they do have opa. They either have it in the grocery in the fresh case or they'll have it in the frozen case. But if you go to a butcher or you go to a seafood monger and you ask them for opa, sunfish, moonfish, roundfish, especially on the Pacific coast or on the west coast, they're typically going to be able to bring it in for you. So it freezes really well, and that's the one thing that people don't think about when it comes to seafood. Frozen seafood is actually sometimes fresher than fresh. When it comes to meat, sometimes you don't, you know, the frozen meat, you can get freezer burn or it's not as high quality. Seafood, because there's a lot of internal fats, actually protect the seafood from those ice crystals breaking into the cellular structure. So there's, you know, if you think about it, fat and oil or water can't, sorry, oil and water or fat and water can't necessarily mix. Um, so the fats protect those ice shards from breaking those cellular structures and you still get a nice piece of fish. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. You mentioned it, and there it is. Yeah. Okay. Delicious. Um, what would you replace instead of shrimp? Because we're talking about shrimp being kind of a over purchased. Yeah, I, you know, the thing with shrimp is, is that when it comes to a crustacean like a shrimp, prawn, um, you know, I like to sub it with a local crab, right? There's really with the shellfish element, you kind of want to find what's local in the shellfish world. A lot of the shrimp is farmed and is farmed overseas. It can be treated with chemicals, and I don't think that people realize is that a lot of their shrimp necessarily does not come local and it isn't treated properly. So when I am buying frozen shrimp, I'm looking for a four-star BAP certified shrimp. It's just two little fish and a white label with stars that are, uh, you know, kind of rating the fish itself or the shrimp itself. Or I look for a local shrimp, a prawn, a spot prawn here in California, or move to a crab, move to, um, you know, even a rock lobster. The real trick is, is that you can actually cook halibut and make it taste like shrimp. You can find the recipes online, but it's just a little a boiled halibut with a little bit of sugar water in there, and you actually can emulate the flavor of shrimp and mix it into your pasta. Scallops are another great option. Scallops are a great, well-managed species, especially the United States caught scallops that come from the East Coast, and you can get those anywhere from the smaller bay scallops to the larger diver scallops, and those are also really wonderful. Cool. So as we see here, you know, people never know when to flip their fish over. As you see, it starts to kind of cook, and then that white, you know, sign that it's the protein has actually started to cook comes up along the side of the fish. It's at this stage, and you see, right, like this hasn't even stuck. I can just move it, and there's not even that much fat in the pan there. Um, so I'll just give it kind of a flip and cook it on each side here. The more surface area there is on a fish, the better, because that surface area can brown, and that's where you get a lot of the flavor. That's called now you're browning. Uh, and so as much of the fish as you can sear and get that nice golden brown on there, the better. Which is why tuna is, and swordfish are such well-known cuts for flavor because they've got a lot of that surface area and it can sear so well. So this is just another one of those random fish that most people haven't heard of that you can diversify your palate with. There's so many underutilized species out there. And if you find your own local fish market, which there's many of them, you can always ask, right? Like, what are they selling that's bycatch? Because when people go out to fish and they're targeting a specific species, and they catch something that's not the species that they're targeting, they get a quota for that species. So they really don't sell that with their targeted species because then it will actually add into their quota. So you can typically get a good deal on some of these underutilized bycatch species or just by helping the ecosystem by eating those because I would say upwards of 30 to 40% of all the fish caught in the world, there's bycatch that gets thrown away. And to me, that's the most wasteful thing in the world. There's a lot of elements to sustainability, waste, to me is the one that I try and hone in on the most and make sure that we're not wasting so much of our kind of marine ecosystem. But yeah, orange juice is certainly a, a, a trick of the trade in the kitchen because you get a little bit of the sweetness, which is nice because the palate needs that sweetness, but you get the acidity from the orange to cut through the richness 
of most restaurant dishes. So I'll just hit it with some of this orange juice right now. Oh, got myself with a little steam. Just off to the side. Turn the heat down a touch. There we go. See, and that caramelizes immediately. And then at this point, I hit it with just a touch of this butter. Now this is a raw milk butter, right? So you're gonna get a lot more nutrition, a lot more flavor in this. And it's gonna help us finish the fish off, right? So you just get that. It's almost an orange butter that we made in the pan. And then at this point, this is where you can kind of play with your own, you know, your own preferences, right? So if you like a lot of different herbs, herbs, this would go really well with herbs, a nice orange basil sauce. You could throw some fresh basil in there, fresh thyme. If you like it spicier, you could throw some jalapeno in there and the jalapeno would add a whole nother kick to it. And then you can even just kind of baste the top of the fish with some of this juice and it makes its own pan sauce. Uh, this is a ton of flavor because you can see where the fish stuck to the pan, it created really, really rich flavor. That's known as fond, which in French is the foundation. And traditionally that's called the foundation of the sauce. So, we, so the sear isn't too hard. So we know that the exterior is not gonna be dry. It's not, it's not gonna be overly chewy. And now what we'll actually do is we'll, we'll turn the heat off and we will allow this to just sit in the pan and finish, right? That's one thing that people don't think about when they're cooking most proteins, right? So whether it's chicken, steak, fish, is that they don't allow the meat to rest at the end. So you cook it to about 80% and then that residual heat will continue cooking it up to perfection. If you pull it at 100%, now you're going 20% beyond and that's where you get that dry, chewy, rubbery protein. Tacos are the best way to be able to utilize your fish in any way. Even if you mess your fish up, nothing, more, nothing better than flaking the fish off, making your own taco platter. Everybody likes to kind of build their tacos their own way. So we put everything together here. We've got some pickled onions. We've got some micro cilantro, pickled carrots, pickled serrano peppers. Cheese is obligatory. Diced fresh tomatoes, taco shells, cabbage, all the accoutrements. And, you know, we'll just take the fish and just kind of throw it right in there and people can kind of flake it open themselves. If you see, as we flake this open, I mean, it, it really is meaty. And you can cook this, as I mentioned, more along the kind of medium to mid rare because it is one of those steakier species. So we got this beautifully kind of seared fish here. Go ahead, build a taco, hit it with some fresh herbs at the end. I've even got a little bit of fresh salsa that we can use just right over the fish. Drizzle, drizzle everything and you know kind of the ultimate fish taco platter right there. So we talked about seed oils, we talked about fish, and now we want to talk about reverse barbecue health-wise. Yeah, why would we do that? Well the reverse sear, uh, reverse barbecue, is it's, it's a much easier way to cook number one, right? So you're not going to burn your meat, you're going to get a much better flavor, you're going to get richer, a richer flavor actually because you're not drying out the exterior. When you sear something initially on that high heat, there's so much moisture in the meat or the protein yeah. that it takes a long time to get the sear on there and it has the tendency to burn or to go deep into the meat, which really just dries it out. Nothing can brown in the presence of steam, so all you're effectively doing is drying out the exterior. And then it's that burn, right? It's that acrid burn that also isn't great for our health. So we try and avoid, especially if we're gonna barbecue, there's a lot of controversy that barbecues, you know, it burns and it's not good for you. So we try and avoid the amount of time that we're putting it on the grill or on that incredibly high heat. And we do that by doing this reverse sear where you slow cook at the start and then you only need a minute or two to finish it on the barbecue. So you get the beauty of the flavor, you get the smokiness of the barbecue um, and it's not burnt and it's not acrid. Right. So we start with a cold steak and a cold pan, which seems like a reverse kind of process here, but that's exactly what it is. It's a reverse sear. And what this does is that this actually brings the temperature up really slowly so that those enzymes still remain in effect below around 115 degrees, which slowly breaks down the meat. It also gives it a much better sear by slowly bringing it up to heat first because you release a lot of the moisture that otherwise would prohibit a really good, long, hard sear. So we're gonna cook it on the grill at the end and we're gonna start with this roughly one inch cut just directly in a 300 degree oven. I am going to um, drizzle this with actually a little bit, I'll go with a little bit of the extra virgin olive oil because we're not bringing it up to a temperature too high and that's just gonna insulate it a little bit and then I'll top it with some smoked sea salt, finishing salt here. 
although we're not finishing it, and then I just kind of rub it together. It's this easy, right? So you go in a cold pan, you don't need to make a mess, you don't need grease splattering all over the place, and then I'm gonna pop this right into a 300 degree oven and cook it until the internal temperature is around 115 degrees, and then when we finish it, we'll bring it up to about 125, which is mid-rare on a ribeye steak. Okay, and that's opposed to, uh, if I normally put it on a grill, what would I have done? Well then, people would do this, but in the opposite manner, right? So they would throw it on the hot grill first, and then perhaps bring it to a lower heat to finish it in the middle, but you don't get that beautiful crust on the exterior, and you also don't have as tender of a steak because you're not letting those enzymes really break the meat down at that slow and low temperature. If you're using fish, you can still apply the same entire you know strategy to it, right? So you can slow cook your fish to start in the oven, and then just to avoid having it stick to the grill, especially if it's a milder, flaky white fish, you can lay some citrus slices on the grill, mm. bring the heat up really high, and then throw the fish on the citrus slices so that it's not sticking to the grill grates themselves, but you get that nice kind of induction, that smokiness from the grill itself. So you get the flavor of the fish and the barbecue without it being overpowering or burnt. Cool, okay. So yeah, as much as we like uh, crispy stuff, guys, it really isn't good for you, whether it's a carbohydrate, which is uh, acrylamide, right? Um, and then the uh, the meat ones, I think, are heterocyclines, I think. But in any event, it's nasty. Even though we want to eat that, don't do it. You know, there's so many things that we could avoid. So if you can still make it tasty, why not, right? Exactly. Um, and the other nice thing about what I think Andrew is saying here is, um, I was talking about we did a grill segment with girls grilling, which because okay. girls are a little afraid of the grill, um, I am. But um, it's nice when you're planning a party. If you already know that your meat or your protein is about 80% done and all you have to do, yep. then that makes it like, okay, I'm done. Yeah, this is a chef's trick, right? Because mm -hmm. if we're doing banquets or we're doing a huge service, we're mm -hmm. always gonna par cook everything. And nowadays, like sous vide, for example, mm -hmm. everybody does that, where you kind of bring it up to a certain temperature, hold it in that water bath, and then finish it at the end. So this is a real, you know, kind of elite technique, they say, but it's so easy to do at home just with your oven and your grill or your oven and your stove top, and it makes your life that much easier. It looks cooked, but it's still, you know, somewhat raw in the center. So now all this moisture is actually released, um, and we're going to lift the grill. We're gonna throw this on a high temp grill about 500 degrees, and it's only gonna need about a minute both sides combined to get that beautiful crust on there and those grill marks. And now we've prevented having to throw this thing on the grill for 20 minutes. We got all the work done in the oven. We're gonna have a more tender steak and a more flavorful steak. So here we go. Yeah. Right. Grab it by the handle. Ew. So we're just looking for grill marks, right? Yep, we're looking for grill marks. We can get a little smoke on there. Uh, as you see, right, we don't have that browning on the exterior, so that's what we're achieving right now. What we did in the oven was we let those enzymes slowly break the meat down as the temperature came up to about 115, 120 degrees. So we're getting a much more tender steak, and then we're also getting the flavor from the grill. And you'll notice is that because there isn't that much moisture on there as it was in the raw state, is that we're able to actually get those grill marks on there. Look at how quickly, oh, how nice. quickly, right? So we'll, we'll give it the old hatch mark turn, then we'll flip it over, We'll get grill marks on the other side, and then we're good to go. From there, finish it with a little bit of fresh butter on top of the steak, and then let it rest. Obviously, that's the key is you wanna let it rest. You don't wanna cut into it right away or else those juices are gonna run out immediately. And voila, got yourself the perfect steak. So we got, look at that. Look at that, we got that beautiful, crisp exterior. It takes a little bit of that lifter meat and it adds a bit of caramelization on there, which is what you're looking for because nobody wants that chewy meat. And I mean, that obviously is a ton of flavor. But even the quick smoke we're getting on this with the lid open, that's still going to impart a ton of flavor. That's another layer in there. And that's what we're looking for. In, in terms of the things that we were talking about today, I think all of these things make sense. Are there other things that you think are worth mentioning in terms of uh, things people need to know in terms of cooking and, you know, being you know, common sense in the kitchen? Yeah, I mean, generally, you know, I think cooking, we've talked a lot about heat, right? And you mm. don't think health and heat, but health and heat are really important in conjunction with each other because you don't want those high heat, the high heat to burn because that's not good for you. We have the tendency to overheat things, right? So going on a low heat is always much easier. If you want to finish with the high heat, so heat is really important, always manipulating the temperature. Think of it like a stick shift car. You don't just go from first to sixth gear. You gotta kind of bring it up and bring it back down slowly. The oils are really important, right? The basics, the fundamentals, the fats, but then the salts too, 
right? Mm -hmm. So actually cooking with, um, you know, fresh sea salt, kosher salt, salts that don't have a lot of those anti-caking agents like the iodized salts, and you get a lot of minerals from good different types of sea salts. Mm -hmm. It affects the palate differently. So play with sea salts. That's a fun way to introduce something different into your cooking without having to learn a whole new skill and technique. How do you get kids? Obviously, would your children eat from this plate? Would they go, oh yeah, this is awesome. Well, what I've noticed with mm -hmm. kids, right, if they make it and they touch the food themselves mm -hmm. and they create it, then they'll eat it no matter what it is. It's hilarious, right? So all of my kids cook things that they otherwise would never order or eat if it was given to them, but when they cook it, they'll eat it. So the most, if you can get your kids involved in the food, the better, right? And mm -hmm. all these little trips, tricks and tips that we're talking about right now are easy ways to get the kids involved because they're amateurs. Yeah. And you know, it can make it a lot easier. So sauces are really fun for the kids and pickling, right? Pickling vegetables huh. and pickling really, you know, different types of cucumbers, for example, is really fun because you start by salting whatever the vegetable is, make your own pickling brine, tons of different flavors and opportunities. The kids can play with that, pour it over the item, and then within an hour or two, you have a quick pickle. Really? So like in one day you have a pickle? Oh yeah, you know, know. absent fermentation, which uh -huh. is really your long traditional pickle, yeah. a quick pickle, uh -huh. all you do is just salt a vegetable, think a cucumber, right? We salt it, we draw out the moisture, and now you have these empty cells where the moisture would have been. You're replacing that with your brine, and then that's what flavors the pickle. So my kids love to just salt the cucumbers, cut them, they're easy to cut with a nice lettuce knife, yeah. and then we, we make a brine, which is just one part salt, um, one part sugar to usually a gallon of water, and then whatever flavor you want cinnamon, dill, huh. garlic, jalapenos if you want to make it spicy or any other chili. Okay. Cool that down and then just pour it over whatever you were pickling and you've got this creation. The kids absolutely love it. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that a great way to cook? Thank you. I love knowing that. So we learned how to reverse barbecue. We learned how to choose the dish, not the fish. And by the way, this could be anything. We did talk about that, salads, tacos, anything. Just think about the foods you like and then put a different fish in there and you got it going. And then of course, we're gonna be choosing different oils now, right guys? So that is good. And Nate, parting words, Andrew. Thank you for having me, I appreciate yeah, it. Thank you, thank you. And thank you guys for joining us. We will see you on the Malibu studio again real soon.